This is Spy Curious, the monthly webinar from PI Education. I'm Hal Humphreys, your host. Today, interview techniques. This is our first webinar after a two month summer break. We're very happy to be back here in the studio, sharing time with you. PI Education presents this webinar once a month on the fourth Thursday of the month. You join us for free. You ask questions of the top, some of the top minds in the business. We get to know a little bit more about you. We're glad you're here. The rules. We are not attorneys. Our guests today happen to be, but we're not. Our opinions are just that. They're opinions. We're glad to share them in the hope that we can all learn from each other. But we're not attorneys and we don't answer legal questions. If you have a legal question, call a lawyer. If you need to leave or take a break, for any reason, don't worry about missing anything. We keep the recorded webinar up here on our YouTube channel for you to come back to again and again. Go ahead and click on the subscribe button just down there. Uh, it doesn't cost you a thing and it's a huge help to us. <clears throat> There's been a lot of talk the past couple of weeks about the Reed technique of interviewing. Johnny Reed and Associates recently filed a lawsuit against Netflix and the creator of When They See Us. Reed and Associates claim that Netflix misrepresented their technique. I have friends in the industry that have pointed out that there are useful parts to the Reed technique. I don't disagree. But, and this is not a small issue for me, I fear that investigators who fix on a subject or a suspect and approach interviews with a preconceived notion are at a serious risk of creating their own bias circuit. When an interviewer approaches a witness with an eye towards seeking an admission of guilt, a confession, they may very well miss important parts of the story. In these instances, an admission-seeking interview is better described as an interrogation. The read technique outlines a series of steps that involve factual analysis, what they call a behavioral analysis interview, and then an interrogation. <clears throat> Wyatt Kaczynski, a student at UVA Law, claims that the Reed method and general interview techniques taught to law enforcement throughout the country are based on the old school third degree. It's focused on getting a person to confess more so than figuring out what actually happened. Kaczynski says this creates a discontinuity between the job of the investigator, which is to analyze clues and witness reports to reconstruct the past, and the interrogator, which is that of a thug or trickster whose function is to cajole or wheedle a confession from an unwilling suspect. How can an investigator best get an accurate account of what a person truly knows about a crime? How about let them tell their story? I'm joined today by Jerry Buting and Reagan Wynn, two trial attorneys. They're both amazing jurists, thoughtful litigators, and pugilists at heart. They've both dedicated their professional lives to fighting for justice. Jerry Buting, trial attorney, <clears throat> you may know him from the Netflix hit series, Making a Murderer. Jerry, thank you for being with us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I've been a practicing criminal defense lawyer in Wisconsin now for, I don't know, over 37 years. Um, I do, I started off as a public defender in Milwaukee. Uh, been in private practice for over 25 years now and um, in my own law firm I do only criminal cases about 50% trials 50% uh, appeals post-conviction work um, and it tend to take the more serious cases um, homicides sexual assaults that sort of thing okay well very good thank you so much for being here Jerry I really appreciate you appreciate okay. you taking the time uh, Reagan Wynn, trial attorney. Reagan and I had a case last month that kept us holed up in a hotel in Wise County, Texas for a full two weeks. Reagan, it's good to see you again. Reagan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Good to see you, Hal. Thanks for having me. Uh, I am a criminal defense attorney. I've never been a prosecutor. I've been doing this 22 years. Uh, two months ago, I left a firm I'd been with for 22 years and started my own practice. Uh, my practice, I, I do both state and federal work, and uh, like Jerry, I think most of, most of my cases tend to be more serious things. I've tried, I've actually probably tried more murders than I've tried anything else. Uh, I 
would guess that I'm at this point probably about 80% trial work and 20% appellate work. Uh, wow. I have never done anything in the law other than a one-year judicial clerkship that anything other than criminal defense work. And I can say without hesitation that um, both of these attorneys, if you find yourself in jeopardy in Wisconsin or Texas, these are two of the guys I would tell you to call first thing. Um, <clears throat> I want to dive right in. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff to kind of chew on here. Um, the Reed technique in the most recent lawsuit. Reagan, do you think that this lawsuit helps the Reed and helps Reed and Associates, or do you think it hurts them? You know, I think it's going to be hard to say. I think the truth of the matter is that the Reed technique is not very good at getting to truth. But unfortunately, I think the Reed technique probably is pretty good at uh, getting people to admit to things, which given the interference of politics in our criminal justice system, uh, I think there's a lot of pressure to get people to admit to things so that they can get cases closed and get it over with. So I don't know how this lawsuit will ultimately play. I think that it, uh, I, I would hope that the public at large will get out of this an understanding of all the problems, but I don't know. Jerry, my question for you is, is kind of along the same lines, but um, do you think that uh, this kind of publicity from, uh, from Reed can serve a purpose to educate the public in, at large about how police obtain uh, confessions? Yeah, you know, it, I was a little bit surprised when I heard about the lawsuit because it, it seems to actually um, increase publicity, negative publicity for the, the corporation. Um, and the, the subject that they decided to sue on, the, this documentary, When They See Us, um, David DuVernay's uh, you know, an award-winning director, producer, um, the, the complaints that they have, I think, were, were really two issues. One was uh, some statement made that the read technique is discredited or, or generally discredited, something like that. And um, I forget the other one right now, but, but neither one of the statements in the documentary struck me as something that would be really um, defamatory. I mean, they were largely, appeared to be opinion-based. Um, and of course, they have the defense that they could be the truth. Um, and so the, the lawsuit will you know, force them to try and defend their technique while at the same time the respondents, Netflix and the, the filmmaker, can actually present evidence that this technique is, in fact, um, risky uh, in, in the producing false confessions. Now, you know, one of the things that, that's interesting about Reed, um, obviously this must be a reflection that they are losing business, probably not just from that documentary, but also from making a murderer. And what what millions of people all over the world saw happen to Brendan Dassey. Right. Um, the very yeah. kind of person, I'm sure we'll talk about that more, but the very kind of person who is at risk for false confessions. Um, young, um, mentally challenged, inexperienced with police. And uh, what Reed tries to argue when there are, whenever there's a false confession and their trained officers are involved is, well, they weren't using our technique. They were going rogue. They went off. They didn't follow the, the recipe, so to speak. Um, but you never hear any criticism of them, of those officers um, that they trained and that they uh, certified um, when they produce false confessions. You just hear them defensively trying to claim, well, they weren't using our technique. Um, so you know, I, I don't know that in the long run it's going to help them, um, but it's, it's, if anything, it's going to perhaps increase the public discussion about it, whether it should be outlawed in this country, as it really has been abandoned everywhere else. In the yeah, and, and that's one of the interesting things to me, like um, in, in Great Britain, I know that they have um, gone to, uh, what is it called, CARE or something like that. Um, oh, 
E-A-C-E. E-A-C-E. Yeah, it's a, it's a different style of interviewing. Um, and they pretty much have gone away from the read technique. Reagan, what do you think about the public perception? Do you think juries are going to pick up on this? I think that most people walk into a courtroom to be a juror thinking there's no way anyone would ever falsely admit, admit to something they didn't do. And I think that through the process, depending on what jurisdiction you're in and what you're allowed to do during the jury selection process, and then obviously through opening statement and through the presentation of evidence, uh, my experience has been that you can really uh, in enlighten jurors about these problems. And I think they are once, a lot of times, once they understand the science and they really think about it, I think they are able to uh, grasp the concept. The problem is m making sure that attorneys and people who work with attorneys are aware of the research and are aware of the science and are uh, aware of ways to present that information in a compelling manner. Right. And I think for, for kind of jury education, you know, we spent a lot of time in the Wise County case uh, in Vordire trying to get things in front of the jury just to kind of educate them. Um, it's a difficult process to get, you know, you've got a whole bunch of things you have to get people to understand. And, and by and large, people on the jury are not attorneys. They're not, you know, they're not necessarily involved in the law in any shape, form, or fashion, and you've got to get them to understand a lot of different things. Um, Jerry, on making a murderer, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I wanted to talk about the Brendan Dassey thing in some detail because the interview with the police, um, I think, is... I've often thought, like, for Vordar purposes, it would be nice to be able to show videos like that to jurors, but you, you can't do that. But... How do you get that across to people? What happened to Brendan Dassey in that police interrogation, which lasted how many hours? Well, it was what was shown on uh, uh, in the docu series "Make It a Murder" was really just one day of a three-day process in which they started sort of softening him up, so to speak. Um, three days earlier, by saying things like, "You know, Brendan, um, you know, there's people in the DA's office." Uh, and, you know, our office and law enforcement saying, why isn't Brendan Dassey charged? You know, he should be charged as, a, as an accomplice in this case already because he was with Stephen Avery that night. He must have been involved. And, uh, but we think you're a good kid and, and we're holding them back. And therefore, they immediately sort of set themselves up as his protectors, his saviors against, the, you know, the tide of people who wanted to prosecute him. Um, and so... Um, you know, one of the things that that documentary did, I mean, it, it, the interrogation of Brendan Dassey was really exhibit A and what's wrong with this read technique um, as employed by too many law enforcement officers. If it's a modification or a um, uh, distortion of what they teach or not, um, it has a lot of the elements of what they teach as being valid science, and it's just not. Um, I think Reagan is right that, uh, I mean, there's, there's twofold. Your question, I think, might have been about jurors. How do mm -hmm. we um, influence or explain this all to jurors? And, and what I find is it really is counterintuitive. Most people would think, you know, I'm not gonna falsely confess. You know, why would I? Um, if I didn't do it, I'm gonna stick it out. But they, but they don't understand the elements and how all this comes about. Um, I, I don't know how many times I'm on Twitter and I, I got, you know, hundreds of, of mothers and teachers, maybe thousands even over the last few years who would write me and say, oh my God, this is just like my son or just like one of my students and I could see this happening to them. Uh, but most people I don't think understand that and I really think it's important therefore to have some sort of expert who can help explain the science behind it the risks of this kind of a technique and why people do falsely confess. Um, we used to, you know, before DNA came out, DNA exonerations occurred, um, almost nobody thought people really falsely confessed, or at least it was the, the huge aberration, a crazy person who comes in and says, I, you know, I killed the Pope or something. Mm -hmm. um, 
But uh, after DNA exonerations uh, were studied, we learned that when it comes to juveniles, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40, 43% of them had falsely confessed to crimes that DNA later proved they were completely innocent. And that's an uh, astonishingly high number. It is. And when you, you know, expand it to all, uh, you know, including adults, I think it was still something like 15% in that range. Right. Um, and so it is a challenge to try and uh, present it to jurors, but we also have to make sure that, that attorneys are educated enough about the process and the risks and what you need to point out um, uh, about the technique that, uh, that is wrong. And, and by the way, one, one very important point right here is only about 50% of the states in this country mandate recording of interrogations by police. That's only, ha only half the states. And that is critical because if the jurors don't actually have an opportunity to see what's going on, how it's being presented, uh, it's a very difficult challenge to convince them that the confession could and very well be false. Right, right, right. Um, Reagan, one of the articles you sent over talked about that very issue of, of recording statements and not just recording the interview, but recording the entire um, holding of a person in custody so that, you know, there's, I can imagine a scenario where somebody would come into an interview after having worked them up for a little bit and then interview them and record that, but not the workup part. Um, what do you think about that, Reagan? You think we ought to record all of them? I think that I personally think we ought to record every law enforcement interaction with any citizen at any time. I mean, in this day and age where we're able to do this uh, seminar online, live and stream it to anybody who wants to watch it, it seems insane to me that we cannot uh, have nearly 100% coverage of recording police citizen interactions. And I think that a lot of citizens and people who wind up on juries would be shocked if they saw every bit of what goes on. Right. I, I don't right. think it's anything like what the general perception of it. I, I don't think the truth is anywhere near in line with the general perception. Right. And I want to make sure that we don't just um, spend the hour beating up on police officers and the read technique. I think there are problems with the read technique. I really do. Um, but I think in, in in theory, the, the notion, the read technique is kind of designed with this three-step process, the factual analysis, the behavioral analysis interview, and then interrogation if it's deemed appropriate to go that far. Um, the, the couple of problems I have with it is, um, you know, the factual analysis part, yes, of course, everybody understands that investigators go out, they gather facts, they gather evidence, they, you know, try to suss out what happened. Um, the behavioral analysis interview portion of the read technique. Um, one of the articles that, that we looked at in, in preparation for this was talking about a lot of the psychology used in that behavioral analysis interview has been proven to be just not good science. Um, you know, the fact that somebody looks up and to the left is not an indication that they're being deceptive. It may not be an indication of anything. Um, and some of the uh, alleged indicators of stress or uh, of, of deception are really just indicators of stress. Um, and I'm telling you, I have been in, in custody before and I had done nothing wrong, but I was nervous and I was feeling stressed and I would have shown no signs. But in, in order to not just, just beat up on police, um, I do want to talk about private investigators and how private investigators conduct interviews. Um, and Jerry, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, I'm going to share this image from my screen. And Jerry, you're going to recognize this. Reagan, I think you saw this yesterday. Um, this is a, a form shown to Brennan Dassey by his criminal defense investigator when he was interviewing him. Jerry, can you tell me what's wrong with this form? <laughs> Well, what's e what's even more wrong with it? I only see the top part in this screen is is um, below the, the picture I'm seeing that. There you go. Okay. Uh, where he's given two choices: I am very sorry for what I did, or I am not sorry for what I did. There's not the third choice, which is I didn't do what I'm accused of. Um, and 
what troubled me the most about it is the fact that there's actually a pre-printed form like this, which means Brendan Dassey is not the only poor guy who's been subjected to this kind of um, uh, interrogation, coercive interrogation. Um, I, you know, quick side note, I, I had not seen that video at all until Making a Murder came out. And, and I was, first I was shocked. I was like, wait a minute. Normally this stuff is turned over in Discovery. We get to see, you know, uh, Brendan Dassey was a potential witness in Stephen Avery's case. And we had to, to go through his police interviews in detail. And then it hit me, wait a second. This reason we didn't get this is because this was defense investigators evidence that, that wasn't turned over in Discovery. Would have had to have been turned over if he actually testified in, in, in Stephen's case. But um, yeah, you know, uh, the, one of the things that I think it, private investigators have to be careful about is falling into this trap that, that they can determine by behavior whether or not someone is telling the truth. Um, that's a, a monumental myth. Study after study shows police officers, no matter how well trained, are really no better than a flip of the coin uh, at judging truth or, or deception. And um, if, in fact, you make the conclusion that the person you're talking to is lying and you, you then, you know, uh, the entire way that you begin to, or, or I guess, to follow up with the, con the questioning of that person is going to be tainted by that viewpoint rather than instead allowing the person you're talking to to tell their story, um, get as much detail out as possible, then go back and challenge some of those details if you want but rather than instead uh, uh, using some of the techniques that Reed teaches, which is you won't accept, if, if the officer decides that the suspect they're talking to is lying, then the, a number of rules come into play. One is that you will not accept any denials thereafter, that you can lie to them, that you can tell them you have evidence you don't, that you can adopt this false friend approach, that hey, we're really just good guys. They did this in Brendan's case. Um, Brendan, you know, yeah, we're police officers and all that, but not right now. You know, I'm a father with a 16 year old just like you and I wanna come over and hug you and, and I know you're hurting and we're gonna go to bat for you and we won't leave you high and dry and on and on and on and on. Um, the kinds of things that encourage people to say things that may not be true just in order to get their help and their assistance. Private investigators have to be careful not to do that. Yeah. when they uh, interview anybody. Yeah, absolutely. I, there's a story that I tell when I um, present at uh, seminars uh, for investigators. And I think I've told this to a lawyers group in Texas. Um, I interviewed a lady in Lubbock, Texas years ago, and I had just gotten through with the deception detection course. Um, and her interview was great. She was really helpful to us. And I called the attorneys that I was working with and I said, <clears throat> you know, based on my, my training, I, she's, she's being truthful and she really helps us. And I was really excited about it. And I was feeling like I had learned, you know, how to tell if someone is being deceptive or not. She mentioned in the interview that she remembers this one specific thing so clearly because she was reading a book and she went back to that book and she said, here's the book I was reading. It really, you know, I was sitting by the poolside reading this book. I remember it and blah, blah, blah. I went back after the fact, looked up the book's publication date. It was six years after the event she was talking about. So I go back to her and I said, you know, eh, here's, here's this book. It was published six years later. And she breaks down, starts crying, said, I lied about the whole thing. I was trying to help my friend. Um, and I had just gotten out of this deception detection training. And that, that hit me so hard because I had gone out on a limb with my client saying, hey, I can tell if this person's telling the truth and I vouched for her based on this training that I'd gotten. Um, it got me really curious about deception detection to the point that <clears throat> my wife and I traveled out to UC Berkeley to speak with David Matsumoto, who is a, a, a kind of a world renowned um, academic who studies uh, deception detection. Uh, he consults with you know the FBI and the CIA. And what they do is they will take a videotape and they deal with micro expressions, right? they'll take a videotape and break it down frame by frame and analyze. So if you've got 60 frames per second, they've got an analyst looking at each frame to determine, you know, what the facial expressions are. Uh -huh. 
Matsumoto said, you know, most of us can tell a coin flip, whether or not someone's telling the truth in real time. He said, if you have 30 years of experience and training and study of this topic, you can increase your ability to tell when someone is lying to you to 53%. Right. So, uh, Reagan, what would you do if I interviewed one of our clients uh, in the same way that um, Mike O'Kelly interviewed Brandon Dassey? Oh, hang on, hang on. You there? I am. Okay, what would you do if I interviewed someone in the same way uh, Michael Kelly interviewed Brandon Dassey? Before or after you peeled me off the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would lose my mind if an investigator working on my behalf did something like this because all I would be able to think about is how that was going to be inserted in my rectum during trial. Yeah. That, it, it, you know, I would be scared to like, please tell me you did not record this. Please tell me there were no witnesses to it other than you and the person and that you're never going to show up anywhere near that courtroom. You know, please tell me that, that I can mitigate this damage. Um, I, I think tying back to what you said earlier about not wanting to beat up on police officers. And I think it's the same for police officers or investigators or lawyers or anybody else. Yeah. Uh, I think that the real issue at some level is confirmation bias. There are people that go into investigators, cops, lawyers, whatever, that go into with a preconceived notion of what the answer is and whether consciously or unconsciously, they set out to confirm their preconceived notion. And if that is what you do, uh, it is very easy to conduct an interview in such a way that you will elicit false information one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, that's one of the things that I have learned over the past 30 something years of interviewing people is to just keep an open mind, ask some questions. And I, I try to take people at face value. I try to just at this point in my career, I, if someone is telling me a story, I don't assume they're lying. I don't assume they're telling the truth. I assume that they're telling me their version of the truth. Um, you know, I, if they tell me something I know to be not factual, maybe they just remembered it wrong, but I try to keep an open mind because at the end of the day, my job as an investigator is to help you, the attorney deal with the facts. And I can't get facts if I'm going in with a preconceived notion. That's you know, Reagan, Reagan makes a good point uh, on confirmation bias. And I think investigators really need to be trained about that uh, so that they're as aware of it as possible. It's a human character trait we all have, whether we are trained scientists or whether we are lay people that, that you know, just ordinary parents of, you know, whatever it might be. Um, with investigators, I, you know, I think it's only human nature to, to maybe have a theory when you're you're coming into an interview. I mean, after all, you're, you're interviewing a person for a reason. You think they might have some knowledge or some information about the case. Uh, but rather than only, if you're really aware that, that you as a human can have confirmation bias, um, then you can pull yourself back a little bit and, and not let that bias direct your entire conversation. Instead, look for things that don't fit that uh, theory that you have going in rather than only looking at those things that do and you know allow the witnesses you know it, facts or statements that are, that are being told to you to, to challenge your belief rather than just confirm your belief one of the things that I, I liked about the the peace method of interviewing is it's, it's based primarily on letting the witness talk right um, and <clears throat> One of the things I have a, a difficult time with sometimes if I go with another investigator to do an interview um, is I like to ask a question and then let the person go. Um, and then if, and make notes along the way, but some investigators want to jump in and ask the next question, ask the next question, ask the next question. I think it's important when you're trying to get factual information about an event, a thing that happened or whatever, that you let the witness talk, just let them tell their story. Um, Reagan, we talked a, a little bit about, um, the confession tapes. Have you seen any of those shows? I've seen a couple of them and, 
I mean, I have had cases where there were things that happened that were similar uh, and nothing as dramatic as an exoneration uh, later, but I have seen things like that happen. So we, we interviewed the filmmaker um, uh, for that series and she, um, after the first uh, series came out, uh, she, she really had it in her head that she was going to, you know, hear sometime in the next six months that there was a, a new look at a trial or an exoneration or something like that. And she was shocked and I think kind of depressed that nothing happened. Um, and Jerry, have you seen any of the, uh, confession tapes series? I have, I've seen, um, uh, the one I remember in particular is, was involving a, a Canadian technique called Mr. Big, um, which is not allowed in, in America, where they, they basically set up this elaborate entrapment scheme to get people to, to make admissions. But I also recall, though, there was a case, an arson um, homicide case from Michigan, where the, um, the law enforcement authorities convinced this mother that she had set the fire in her daughter's bedroom that killed her. And this is the Karen Bowes case? Yes, that is. The yeah. Case. yeah. Uh, when in fact there was evidence that the girl uh, might very well have, and probably did set it herself, that she was suicidal. And, um, but one of the things that struck me about this, so that they're, they're doing this whole long interview with her in the police station and eventually get her to, well, maybe, yes, I, you know, is it possible I did this? Yeah, you know, and then, uh, they, but they say we're, you know, they're really, they're, they use a soft approach that, you know, we're on your side, we're here to help you, et cetera. And then right after the interview, they walk out of the police station to like a Sally Port or a, a, a wagon to take her away. And the media is gathered there uh, to get the perp walk. It's like they called them there they weren't going to try and help her at all. They wanted a big splash immediately after telling her just the opposite. So that was a troubling one. Yeah. And that one, um, I remember that episode specifically because there was, they, they kept on presenting her with hypotheticals. You know, is it possible that this happened? Is it possible that this happened? And then it seemed like they took the, her answer to the hypotheticals and presented that as this is a confession. And it's like, hmm. That's it. It was so troubling. Um, and there are so many stories like that. Um, one of the other things I want to talk about, about false confessions, and we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but um, Reagan, how, how do we explain to people, number one, that false confessions happen, and number two, how they happen? How do, how do we explain that? Because we, we, and we talked about this earlier, but I want to go back into it. It's like, I can sit here and say, I would never admit to something I didn't do, but I've also never been in a very small room with bright lights and a start table and a, a, a pee test size cup of water for eight hours. Um, how do we get people to understand that this actually happens? I think that a couple of ways, but frankly, I think that while I don't, necessarily like about be, being asked about true crime TV shows and podcasts everywhere I go when people find out what I do. I do think that sort of the uh, widespread viewing of those things on TV and people who listen to the podcast constantly has started to make the public a little more aware of them and make them a little more open to the idea. And uh, as a trial lawyer, what I would say is I would be if I had what I thought was a false confession case and how would know this from watching me do it for three hours, one day last month, uh, I would be asking the jurors who here has watched true crime shows. And the first time I heard somebody say, Oh, I watched the false confession show. It's like, which one did you watch? What happened? What'd you think about it? Has anybody else seen that? Uh, I tend to think that jurors read anything I say, they're going to take with a grain of salt and think I'm a paid mouthpiece. So, it may not be true, but if you can get them talking about it in Fort Iyer or jury selection, uh, you can, they'll believe what everybody else says around them, what their fellow jurors say. I think that's the first thing. And then I would go back to something Jerry said earlier. Uh, 
unfortunately, you probably need to cough up the money and hire a legitimate expert who knows what they are doing, bring them to court, and have them explain this to the jury. Once you see somebody who really understands the science, explain the studies, explain how the studies work, it kind of makes sense. You know, your, your emotional response is, I would never admit to something I didn't do. But then if you really stop and think about it, and you listen to it, you go, okay, well, I can kind of see how that could happen. And right. I, I think that's really the rub. Yeah. Jerry, anything to add to that? Well, just one of the, one of the other challenges is, um, you know, most of the time you're dealing with clients who are uh, poor um, or uneducated or with mental limitations. And that's not typical of, of who you're going to have your jury populated with. They're oftentimes suburban people who, um, you know, really wouldn't falsely confess. Um, so you also have to kind of break through those class differences and get people to understand that, look, you know, I mean, if you're a person of color or recent immigrant status um, uh, or some other, you know, disfavored group in society, and the police are telling you, hey, we got your fingerprint on the gun, or we got your DNA. You know, you, you've got to come clean with us, or it's going to go worse for you. Mm -hmm. And you think, you know, how could they have my fingerprint? They must have planted this. You know, you start thinking, who are they going to believe? Are they going to believe me, this uneducated, uh, poor black person from Detroit, uh, wherever you might be, versus the police officer? And, you know, and, the, and then they start working on you and get people to, to confess using those things. So you, I think you do have to try and also put the jurors in the, the, the shoes of the suspect at the time it's going on. It doesn't always have to be a long eight-hour interrogation either. I mean, oftentimes people, you know, falsely confess within a couple hours, um, right. given their um, suggestibility or their weaknesses and the kinds of techniques they're used. Right. Um, you know, has, have, have you seen when they see us? Have you seen that show? I'm sorry. Have you seen the, the, the show when they see us? Yes, that, I have. Okay. Yes. I, I have not watched the entire thing. Um, I started watching it earlier in the week. Um, my wife was doing something at the same time. I asked her if she'd watched it. She said, honestly, I started and then it got to the interrogations and I, I felt sick in my stomach, just couldn't do it anymore. Um, it, you know, it what, was, when you do watch it, one of the things that, that is maybe most troubling, I mean, you know, it's a, um, you know, it's, it's actors playing these roles, um, but then they bring in the actual um, uh, Central Park Five at the end and, and you get to, to see them a little bit. But um, so that each, each of the five has a different re circumstance that causes them to confess. And, and one of the ones that really troubled me was when the police brought in the father of one of the suspects and um, you know, and his son is saying, look, I didn't do it dad. And he starts yelling at him saying, you gotta just admit to this. They're gonna do this if you don't. And uh, it's gonna ruin my business if blah, blah, blah. So he brought kind of his own personal stuff into it. And I'm sure the father really felt horrible after that, but he got his son to confess um, yeah. using a loved one. That doesn't happen very often, probably, but um, you never know. And um, you know, with, with the Michael Kelly thing uh, and Brendan Dassey, you know, Brendan's told, hey, this guy's working for you. Uh, he, you know, your attorney brought him here. Um, he initially was resistant to O'Kelly's suggestions, but then O'Kelly is kind of like a father to him, you know, adopting that role. I can help you. Mm -hmm. I want to spend the rest of your life in prison. If you don't say this, you're going to. And, um, and so that's, you know, that was a, a big factor. And I think that was a factor, at least for some of the central five suspects. Right. right. Or, I had, um, I had a, a case in, in Clarksville, Tennessee where uh, they brought the defendant in put him in the the tiny white room with the table and one small glass of water and then they just left for an hour and then they came back in and asked if he needed anything he said some water so they left for another hour then came back with water and then they come back with his mom and put her in the room and have her talk to him and they're recording the whole thing 
hoping that he's going to tell his mom, you know, something it, it, it it's disturbing to watch. Yeah. Um, and again, I think for private investigators, nine times out of 10, um, Reagan, how often do we get to investigate situations um, even a month after the alleged thing happens? Unfortunately, not many. Uh, right. My experience has been that the faster we are able to get in, the better the result tends to be in the end. Uh, right. We get to, the quicker we can get to people and get them interviewed, the quicker we can uh, get an objective, open-ended interview done and find out what the actual truth is before memories have changed, people have become, for one reason, wedded to some fact or not uh, based on circumstances other than what actually happened or what they saw. Right. Um, when, when most of us investigators uh, that are out there practicing, it's, it's a banner day if we get there a month after the thing happened. If we get there within a week, that's fantastic. But usually it's at least three, six, 12 months after the fact. Um, so we have to come at it with this, this notion of, I kind of don't really know anything. Help me understand the old Columbo technique of, you know, help me understand what happened here. Um, but there, there are some things that I think investigators can do. And, and I'd like to touch on this. And I know Reagan and I have, have discussed this in the past, but if you're going to interview a witness, uh, as an investigator, my suggestion is always read everything you can that that person has said on the record, in the newspaper, in the press, on Facebook, read everything you can about that person, prep for the interview so that when they tell you something different, you know, their either their memory has been, been modified or they're changing their story for some other reason. Um, but my question is, uh, Jerry, how do you talk to your investigators about, you know, going out to interview witnesses? What do you prefer they do to get ready to go talk to witnesses? Yeah, I give them everything I can in advance. Um, prior statements of the, the witness, prior statements of other witnesses. Um, I, I think you're right. You, you want a knowledgeable uh, investigator uh, questioning the, the, the person so that they know you know, where something doesn't fit the facts, either because they're lying or because their their memory is, is faulty now, as you say. Um, it's really a challenge in my post-conviction cases, which where you're talking about not just months, but often years later, and you have to have an investigator go out and talk to somebody. Um, but the other thing that sometimes is, is useful in this day and age, I mean, more and more uh, surveillance cameras are capturing various angles and, and maybe parts of, of events and um, or body cams that police officers in some jurisdictions have uh, and, and uh, you know I, I want my investigators to look at those too so that so that they can not immediately start challenging the, the, the person they're speaking to but let the person tell their story as they recall it and then go back and kind of say, well, what about this fact? What about that fact? I mean, one of the things I always say about people who lie, people who make up stories is um, it's easier to catch them in the lie because they, they don't remember what they said before. Since it didn't really happen, they're, they're, they're trying to remember a story rather than something they actually experienced. And to the extent that the investigator is really, really prepped and knowledgeable, the better opportunity there is uh, to be able to to pick up on those little little problems with someone's story. Right. And the fun thing about working on post conviction cases, not that there's anything particularly fun about it, but the, from an investigator standpoint, um, if it's post conviction, there are reams of paper, you right. know, pretrial hearings, trial transcripts, interviews, all that stuff that you can kind of dive into. I, I, there was a case I worked on in Amarillo, Texas, post conviction case, young ladies on death row still to this day. Um, and I remember one witness interview, the law firm sent me a packet of information and they said, we've allocated 22 hours for you to read, which is amazing. 
Yeah. Um, so Reagan, uh, prepping before uh, you go out to talk to witnesses, what else would you tell an investigator to do before they go talk to a witness? Um, I'd, I'd like to put this in context first. Um, to me, what an investigator is doing is they are gathering <laughs> raw data. I will figure out how to process the data, cherry pick it and use it Per, to my persuasive advantage in court. But what I need from an investigator is as much as we can get. So while I certainly want the investigator to be prepared with every statement that the witness has ever made and to know if the witness is making inconsistent statements, I don't ever want, well, I shouldn't say don't ever. In general, and I guess things could change case to case, I probably don't want the investigator to confront the witness with the prior inconsistent statement. Now I might, there might be a case where I could say, yeah, find out why they, what their explanation for saying something different is. But in general, what I really want is if we get somebody lying, I just want you to make them repeat the lie as much as you can, especially if it's someone who is arguably a, a prosecution witness, just make them say the lie as many times as you make them say it, that we can document. Uh, I want, the other thing I want my investigators to do, and I'll, I'm not trying to just blow sunshine on Hal here. This is one of the things I like about Hal. I want investigators that are thinking outside the box and big picture. So we might have a witness who just saw one little event two weeks before the supposed offense. But when we go interview that witness that we don't really know anything else about, I wanna know if that witness knows anything at all about any of the other participants, any of the other witnesses. I want to know if he has, if, if this witness has a sufficient basis to have an opinion about you know, uh, uh, the character for truthfulness of the defendant, or the character of truthfulness of the defendant, the character for being violent and aggressive or law-abiding for the defendant, or the character for being violent or aggressive or law-abiding for the defendant. I want to know I, my experience has been that a lot of times we get tunnel vision and we get a police report that says so-and-so saw this two weeks ago. And then we think, okay, well, this person is involved only in two weeks. And then we find out somewhere down the road, oh my God, they were involved in all these other conversations months before this thing, or they've been involved after. So I want the investigator to really stop and think, okay, we know what the police report says in the universe of knowledge that is out there. What else could this witness possibly know? Uh, because my, the thing that keeps me up at night as a trial lawyer is that I'm going to hear something in a courtroom that I haven't heard before. It happens, but that's what worries me. If I know the universe of information, I can deal with most anything. It's when something comes out that I've never heard before that we have problems. Right. So I <laughs> hope that investigators will be able to minimize that risk as much as possible for me. Right. And one of the things for, for the folks out there in the room today, um, you know, we, we talk in the investigative world about good facts and bad facts. And at the end of the day, our job is not really to try and push a witness one direction or another. Our job is to gather the information and then take it to our clients, the attorneys, and let them deal with it. I'm going to guess, Jerry, if there are bad facts out there, you want to know what they are. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. You do not want to be surprised by that in the middle of your trial. Um, you need to know what the facts are, whether they're good or bad. And, um, you know, and then it really is up to the lawyer to, to, to figure out whether they're bad, whether a fact is really bad or not. I mean, there might be another explanation for it that makes it less bad than it might appear uh, at first blush. Um, same thing with good facts. I mean, you know, they're one of the risks, of course, of, of not challenging a, um, a witness, not having the investigator challenge a witness on an inconsistency is that the, by the time they get into court, they've come up with an explanation now, particularly if they're a state's witness and they've prepped and you know been coached and prepared how to deal with that inconsistency. Um, but generally, I, I think I agree with Reagan that I would rather leave it to the lawyer to to challenge the witness in court. Just get the fact out. If it's an inconsistent version, have that um, memorialized and then 
uh, almost whatever explanation they have in court, we can deal with. Right, right, right. And I, I want to go back to this notion of um, a lot of times investigators, uh, I like to say we should stay in our lane. Um, you know, there are a lot of investigators that, that have law enforcement experience and they want to tell the attorney, here's what you do with this. My advice to the people in the classroom is, um, for a number of reasons, gather the facts, share those facts with your client, your attorney, and let them decide what to do with them. Um, they've, I mean, I didn't go to law school. I don't know how to think like an attorney. Um, my job is to gather facts and bring them to the attorney. Uh, we're down to about 10 minutes left. I want to talk a little bit about deliverables uh, from investigators to attorneys. Um, I know how Reagan and I have worked together in the past, and it's a, it's a process of interview. Um, so the last case we worked on was a juvenile case. So in the beginning of the case, it was civil because he, he was still a juvenile. They certified him as an adult, and it became a criminal case. Um, Reagan, talk to me about deliverables in when it's a civil situation. Um, you know, in the civil context, and fortunately, well, in the civil context, obviously the rules about discovery and production can be different. Um, I think that as far as deliverables, I like reports, I need reports, uh, and I need as much deta written detail in a report as I can get because for me that becomes the source document. And I, you know, once it's memorialized, I can, I can deal with it and I'll be able to look back on it six months or six years from now if I need to and, and get the information. So one of the things, and this is one of the reasons I work with Hal, uh, I have to have good written reports and a lot of investigators just aren't used to that. Um, the second thing that I want as a deliverable from an investigator, I think that lawyers are, and Hal has heard me say this, I think we are screwed up. We have lawyer brain. We went to law school for your mind to work in the way uh, that it has to, to be a good attorney. You almost necessarily don't look at the world the way the rest of humanity does. So I put a lot of value in investigators telling me, how is this person going to come across as a witness? Do they seem genuine? Do they seem... Uh, believable? Uh, are they going to come across as someone who has a axe to grind? Are they going to come across, even if I know they have an axe to grind, is it not going to matter because they're going to come off across as believable anyway? And I really rely on those observations and I like it when investigators are particularly attuned to that. I love to see a report and say, this is how this person looks and this is how they came off and you know, this is how he talks and this is how what her uh, mannerisms are like, or she seems very excited, or she seems very calm. I wanna know those things, because then I can put that into the calculus of how I'm going to deal with them on the witness stand. Right, right, right. Um, Jerry, uh, deliverables, what do you wanna see from your investigators? Well, I think we have to be careful for our viewers because um, the discovery rules do vary from one uh, jurisdiction to the next. And Absolutely really need to take the lead from the lawyer on this um, in terms of, um, you know, is the investigator's report going to be a mandatory disclosure? Um, Wisconsin, for instance, if you record, we'll talk about that in a minute, but if you record a statement of a witness or have the witness sign the statement adopting it as, as theirs, um, then it must be turned over to the other side in the criminal case. Um, if not, if it's just a, an investigator's report, um, then, uh, then it's the investigator's statement. And only if the investigator takes the stand, him or herself, perhaps to impeach a witness, only then does it become disclosable and discoverable in a criminal case in Wisconsin. Okay. That's not the rule everywhere, though. So you have to be careful about that. Um, there are also things like uh, work product privileges and, and mental impressions um, are typically privileged. And so some jurisdictions, you may want your investigator to put that in the report. It might actually help, you know, protect it under work product. Others, you may not. Um, 
But I do like, whether it's in a report or not, I do like Reagan. I do always like to talk to the investigator about their mental impressions, you know, not just the facts. What did you think of this witness? How, how well did they come off to you? Um, you know, it makes a difference if you know, oh yeah, this, this person looks like they're really, you know, uh, a drugged out uh, individual who's, who's really not gonna come off very credible versus somebody who's, who will. Um, so I also believe that reports, well-written reports are critical. This is something that a lot of investigators uh, maybe don't practice or aren't as good at. Or, um, but you have to be careful about what you write and how you write it because it can be um, it can be misinterpreted. If you if you know if your sentence is constructed the wrong way, it may look like one thing when you actually mm -hmm. meant something else. Yeah. So um, so I like I like to get a good written report as well. Okay. One of the things I'd like to talk about for the folks in the room today, um, investigators in particular. Uh, when you're dealing with interviewing witnesses, um, and the, we're going to kind of go to the, the wrap up phase of the, the webinar because we're getting really close to the, to the end of the hour. Um, you know, preparation is key. Always try to keep yourself, um, you know, prepared, uh, read as much as possible. Uh, depending on what your attorney client wants from you, either when I'm working in Texas, if Reagan and I work together uh, and it's a criminal case, I will almost always record the interview. I do this for a couple of reasons. Number one, it cuts out the middleman. I'm not going to interpret what the person said. I can hand Reagan a transcription of the interview and he can see not only what the person said, but what I asked. Um, Reagan in, in Texas, is, is that immediately discoverable? Does it have to be turned over? Or is that something that, that doesn't have to be turned over? Uh, it is not immediately discoverable. Um, there is an argument that could be made that under what used to be called the Gaskin rule, that once the witness, once the witness hits the witness stand, if we call them, that after we pass them, they can say, do you have any recorded statements? Now, I will tell you, I would still be screaming work product at them, and we would have a complete meltdown about whether or not we were going to turn it over that might or might not involve me going to jail or you if you're lucky how and then uh and then litigate it all the way up and see what happens but uh recorded statements i, I like them in some ways they make me nervous in others and right. i'll tell you this even if there's not a recorded statement i want as many quotes in a report as i can get direct quotes as many of them as you can get Right. And then going back to uh, the thoughts and impressions, the mental impressions section, it's one of the things I try to do um, in a fairly decent amount of detail. I will describe the person's home, how it's, whether it's clean, tidy, not junky, beer cans all over the place. Um, I, I went into a house in Tennessee one time where I was with another investigator and he said, here, have a seat. And I sat down on, on dog poo in, in the chair. It's like, all of these things help your client understand who this person is. Um, I have, I've turned over a report to an attorney in which I said, this person is batshit crazy, but they're going to present well as a witness. Um, so you, you, sharing your impressions with the attorney, I think is really important. The other thing as investigators, um, it's all about the facts. Get as many facts as you can. Get your attorney as much information to work with as possible. Um, Reagan, Jerry, I sent you guys talking points. I don't think we got to anywhere near all of them. Um, I can't thank you guys enough for being here today and for being willing to play along. It's been a huge help. I know everybody's enjoyed it uh, out in the crowd today. Um, parting thoughts. Jerry, have you read the book Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell? Uh, no, I've read other of his books, but not that one. He's got a new book out called Talking to Strangers, and it is about uh, the human condition of defaulting to truth. Um, we tend to believe people as human beings. It's what we're kind of meant to do. Otherwise, society doesn't work. I think if we as investigators can kind of approach our interviews with that default to truth notion and not... Um, browbeat people and try to get them to say something different, <clears throat> we might be better investigators at the end. Reagan, have you read the book? I have. 
Tell me your thoughts about it. I think every lawyer, investigator, or frankly, anyone else involved in the criminal justice system ought to be required to read it twice. Right. Uh, it, it explains why a lot of times uh, you will have what do not appear to be credible allegations just accepted without question. It explains why when police officers get on the witness stand, a lot of jurors just presume that they are whatever they say happens to be true and that they would, you know, it explains the whole where there's smoke, there's fire problem that I think criminal lawyers have, right. which is, you know, we would not be here if that guy hadn't done something. Right. And uh, I, I think it is a very valuable, it has a lot of valuable insight in it. Okay. One other book I want to push, Jerry Buting, I know you've got a book out there. Tell us about that real quick before we get off the line. Sure. It's called Illusion of Justice, Inside Making a Murderer and America's Broken System. And it's partly about uh, making a murderer, but it's also sort of a memoir, uh, making a criminal defense lawyer, what it, what it takes to do what we do, why we do what we do. Um, and it talks about a lot of other cases I've had handled in my career where there are similar kinds of flaws and issues that have come up that you that are touched on in making a murderer. Very good. Uh, gentlemen, thanks so much. And I'm assuming folks can go to Amazon and find that, Jerry? Yes. yes. Jerry Buting, say the name of the book one more time for me. It's called Illusion of Justice, Inside Making a Murderer and America's Broken System. I love it. Uh, Jerry Buting, thanks so much for joining us today. I can't thank you enough. Reagan, thank you, sir. I appreciate it, Al. All right, you guys have a good afternoon and a good weekend. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.